Hey, everybody, it's the Plant Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. I'm so happy to be with you here today. There was a while there, I didn't think it was going to happen. Uh, starting tomorrow, I am traveling for the next two months. I just got back from the Milken Institute Global Conference was speaking with Bloomberg Intelligence. Now I'm headed off to Yale University to speak about investing sustainability and our global food supply system. I'll be headed to Washington, D.C. to attend the AIM Global Summit and so much more between meetings in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles. Uh, I'll sneak in a family vacation. It's crazy over the next two months. So the Plant Based Business Hour will be at varying times, so just kind of stay tuned. So happy that you are here with me today, and so is my guest. Often we talk about plant-based foods. Is it a fad? Is it a trend? Perhaps you've seen some recent articles in the news. Well, they focus solely on the U.S., but what about the rest of the world? And First of all, is the U.S. keeping up? Up. And really, what kind of growth and adoption are we seeing in the rest of the world? Today, we focus on Asia. And so I bring my guest, Mikhail Klar, who is the founder of Better Bite Ventures and also of Future Food Now newsletter. So happy to have you with me. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Elizabeth. Great to be here. Okay. I think of you as the Asia expert, and it's just a thrill to be able to talk about other parts of the world today, of course, and to be with you. But before we go any further, Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes. I am. Okay. Phew. Phew. We, we had not a lot of time in the green room before this interview, and I just want to make sure I am. <laughs> um, so happy to be with you. So let's kind of set the stage just a little bit. People often think the U.S. It's where innovation happens, and therefore it's where adoption must occur. It is often assumed. But when we look at the world stage, we see that Europe is much better at adopting alternative proteins than the U.S., for example, countries like Holland, Germany, the U.K., even Austria, often putting the U.S. to shame. Just a, a tidbit of a story, if you will, McDonald's doubling down on Beyond Meat and really adopting those products full time in many different countries would be one small example. Um, Germany's consumption of meat going down. This was always predicted by Global X, but here we have one country actually implementing that. So, you know, it's not all about the U.S. And I wondered if you could help us set the stage. First, I want to say, set me straight for Asia. Would it be fair to say that there's a natural inclination to accept alternative proteins because things like tofu and tempeh have always been a part of APEC cuisine? Is that fair to say? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a tricky question. Uh, ah. And there's no obvious answer. I mean, in a sense, yes, you could say so, but uh, people are more used to um, protein from other sources than meat. And this specifically means tofu in, in most of Asia, tempe in some of the uh, um, Asian countries. But also these products were are not considered necessary meat alternatives, first of all, and they are often considered a cheap source of protein. So as the Asia gets more and more affluent, uh, consumers tend to migrate from uh, tofu or tempeh-based protein to meat, to actual animal meat, and they consider it a symbol of affluence, they consider it something that they want to eat more uh, and want to eat on a regular basis. And this is what's driv driving the, the, the meat consumption in Asia right now. So like over 40% of meat production and consumption is currently in Asia. So it's actually more than all of North America and South America combined. Uh, mm -hmm. And more over 70% of seafood consumption uh, mm -hmm. and production is happening in Asia right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Even most milk right now, but Asia is number one in milk and this quadrupled in the last 30 years. So all of this is driven by this affluence, growing affluence, and of course, growing population uh, mm -hmm. in Asia. Um, so the fact that there was this, you know, tofu and tempeh and other si part of soy protein, the jury is out there if it's really helping or, or hurting this, this new meat alternatives in a sense. Mm -hmm. Maybe because it's historically always been available, it's nothing right. new, it's nothing cool, it's nothing innovative, it's just the same old thing that we used to have. And it's funny that you mention that really it's considered the cheap alternative because in today's age, when I speak about the S-curve adoption of alternative proteins, I'm always talking about S-curve adoption only happens because of price parity and the cheapness of high quality protein. So to be throwing away high quality protein, Tempe, one of the most 
one of the best foods for you on the planet fermented it's a whole food it's gobs of right. protein and it's inexpensive i mean to to think that that would be um a strike against it here in asia is interesting although i do understand when you say that as these countries get wealthier so i'm speaking about apac but i'm also speaking about africa and india um of course, with wealth comes status, and with status, unfortunately, comes meat. Is that a fair statement to say for Asia, APAC? Oh, it's hundred percent true. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, like for for uh, basically all the history, meat was a luxury in most emerging markets, including Asia. And now, suddenly, with this growth in affluence, people and consumers can afford afford to buy it on a regular basis, and they want to eat it. And who are we also to? not to give them this chance, right, in a sense. So, you know, that's 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 an interesting point of view as well. So I think it's all about can we find a sustainable way of delivering this meat-like experience uh, to consumers in Asia and everywhere uh, that will satisfy this craving and satisfy the symbol of affluence uh, that they are looking for, uh, but without all the downsides. You know, I don't think I was familiar with a statistic that says 40%, if I'm quoting you correctly, 40% of yes. the world's meat consumption comes out of APAC. Did you say that? That's right. Yeah. That's right. 42% uh, of this. Point. And what's important, it's still growing. It's growing. Like, it's if you look at the other regions, it's mostly stagnating or even declining in some cases. But in Asia, it's still growing. Mm -hmm. And um, the curve, according to Global X, which... Um, uh, um, Rethink X, excuse me, <laughs> the um, expected downturn of meat, according to Rethink X, they did a report on animal agriculture and its future. It did come out prior to COVID, so it might be a little different now. It came out in 2019. 2025 was to be the top year of meat consumption globally, and it would start going down there. In fact, going down into a death spiral. So that research says, do you think that that's accurate for Asia, that 2025 might be the highest consumption and it's down from there? I, no. I don't think this, this is probably a global number. And I'm guessing what will what they will, are assuming is that by that time, the decline in Western markets will be so severe that it will actually somehow overbalance uh, the growth in Asia. That would have to be assumption because I don't think things will shift so quickly in Asia. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand this. It reminds me of a plant-based business hour where I had David Young, the CEO of Green Monday, Omni, Omni Foods, um, Omni, Omni Pork, one of my very favorite products, specifically Omni Spam. I know that <laughs> sounds crazy because I never ate Spam in the US, but I grew up in Paris. And there's this salad called... Um, uh, frisé au lardon, where you take basically spam, just like chunks of fat, <laughs> and you fry it and you throw it into a really healthy light salad, basically mucking up the salad. So when I got my hands on Omni pork spam, I was like, okay, I'm going to air fry this. I'm going to throw it into my frisé. Uh, it's the only time I've ever been able to have frisé au lardon as a vegan. It was pretty gosh darn awesome. Anyways, all of this is to say David Young was on the show. And, and I think back to this very simple comment, which was so powerful then, we have to outcool them because he said it's been so long that these countries have been seeking out wealth and status like the U S that the minute they get their hands on it, they don't want to settle for something that's environmentally sound, but not cool. And th these alternative proteins have to have that cool factor to be the more expensive, chicer thing that people want. What do you think about that comment? No, absolutely. And I think I think we have to. Uh, this is a nice way to frame it. Uh, out cool them, and um, and it's it's super important. I don't think anybody cracked it yet in Asia, frankly. I mm. think it's still uh, too early to say if 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 there's somebody on the track to uh, only did a great job uh, in their home market of of Hong Kong uh, and expanding throughout Asia step by step. But I don't think we have like a true success story where there's like a really mainstream cool brand that would overcome this you know this perception of meat as uh, animal meat as as affluence symbol uh, mm -hmm. and people would also consider it cool enough mm -hmm. it's disconcerting because 
you see how the human psyche works as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and just for the record, for anybody watching here, you know, live on LinkedIn, but also those of you listening on audio, um, Mikhail, you are not from Asia originally. You're from Holland. Is that right? Yeah. And so I'm from Poland originally. You're from so Poland. I'm, yes. Ah! Yes. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. I moved to Asia about 13 years ago. So I lived throughout uh, Asia, but yeah, as you, as you can guess, I'm not originally from there. Okay, so you personally might not have this issue, but as I understand the numbers, 65% of the U.S., and I also believe the world, but I think at least I'll go for the U.S., 65% of the U.S. is lactose intolerant. That's going to be much higher among African Americans, and almost 99% in Asian Americans, lactose intolerant. So when Coca-Cola, ultimate cool factor, Coca-Cola goes to Asia bringing milk and bringing sickness and disease, I am amazed to hear that Asians are adopting milk. Help me understand this because it makes them ill. Do I have yeah, that right? It's, it's interesting. I mean, like there's high percentage of lactose intolerance for sure and throughout Asia. Uh, I'm trying to unpack it myself as well and understand sort of the perception as there. I would say like in China, for example, where I spoke with some people recently, uh, they estimate is that about half of people are even aware of their lactose intolerance. Mm -hmm. Half wouldn't be aware. Um, and then the half that is aware is still don't, is not considering it necessarily a big deal. So like they would still occasionally consume um, dairy products even for pure pleasure, not, not even necessary for nutrition, and just accept the fact that it will give them a little bit of a achy stomach or whatever other reaction. It's not a huge reaction in their, in their mind. So that's kind of one side of it. Another side of it is that milk was similar to how it was in the West. Last year's was presented as very nutritious um, yeah. uh, food. And, and you know, this, this perception was built that this is uh, the best way to sort of supplement your, pro supplement your protein and calcium. And that's, you know, the same um, perception that you can see in the West, you can see among many Chinese and Asian consumers. Uh, and the consumption is growing throughout the region. So I don't know the Asian legal landscape, but here in the U.S., the campaign milk does a body good. I believe it was the USDA, might have been the FDA, but I believe it was the USDA that was sued for that um, commercial and they had to take it down because indeed milk does not do a body good. And, um, you know, they're, they're encouraging people to eat that, which makes them sick. W will the legal system catch up or what, what kind of, um, what's the cultural zeitgeist for alternative facts? Um, I don't think there's necessarily, it's, it's definitely government driven in many places. So, you know, you would have uh, programs that are, I guess, somewhere similar to US where milk is served in, in schools as mm -hmm. sort of extra nutrition, um, not necessarily maybe advertised the way, you know, we know it from, from the West and got milk campaign specifically and checkoff programs and so on. Um, I, I think it's it's uh, it's probably hard to see anybody challenging it anytime soon. So that that won't happen. I rather personally believe in solution being driven by technology, by startups mm -hmm. and innovators that are coming up with new solutions. That's what we are trying to do, and people we try to support as well when we invest, and you know find just more viable alternatives to produce essentially equally nutritious products, right? That can be still mm -hmm. served in the same environments. Uh, mm -hmm. People still can enjoy it and, and get the, all the nutrition from, but just mm. derived, not from animals. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm so sorry for those of you listening on audio only, but I'm going to pull up a chart here from the Good Food Institute because uh, Mikhail was kind enough to segue us nicely into investment. What kind of investment is happening into alternative proteins and alternative dairy, alternative meats, alternative foods in Asia? So let's go ahead and see if I can share the screen and I'll walk everybody through it. Um, here we have, let me scroll down to the right place from a global standpoint. Let's just set the stage. Can everybody see? Yes, I see that we do not have this. Hold on, everyone. Um, I see. Yes. Okay. So 
you should be able to now see the screen. And um, you might have to squint, you might have to get in there real nice and tight, but just setting the stage from the global annual alternative protein and invested capital and deal count. So you see in 2022, down significantly from 2021, um, there was about 2.9 billion invested into alternative proteins, about 14.2 billion since its inception. But I believe I have a nice chart here about specifically what's going on in Asia and the rest of the world. You know, uh, Europe, as we started this podcast, um, really outpacing everybody. But you see historically, looking from 2013 on to today, 2022, you see that North America is investing it's not necessarily that they're investing less. It's that other parts of the world are starting to invest more. So you see APAC um, and Australia, Australia, Asia, uh, up 19% or 19% of the 2022 investment uh, sum. So I think that's interesting. Let me see if I can find a, aha, here's the, what I really wanted to show everyone. So for APAC and Australasia, you see 562 million invested in 2022 into alternative proteins. That's going to include cultivated meat and fermented proteins as well as plant-based. And that's up 43%. Mikhail, why is it up all of a sudden? Oh, it's not all of a sudden. It's it's been growing for a while, but it's it's been like a really really good year uh, for APAC uh, of protein investing. And definitely, as you can see from here, it's like fastest growing region uh, among all of them. Uh, yeah, I think it is driven partially. You know, finally we are catching up with the reality that Asia is the biggest protein market and the fastest growing. Uh, and the, so from both, you know, there are two types of investors and sometimes it's mixed. Some of them are profit driven, some of them are impact driven, and some of them are a bit of both in different proportions. And if you look from both profit opportunity or return opportunity, Asia is the place to be, right? Because in, in you know, next five to 10 years, depending on your investment horizon, this is where all this new wave of uh, major alternative protein companies will be built just given the population trends and consumption trends. Uh, and the same goes for impact. You know, there's no solution for global issues around food system without Asia. It's as simple as that. I want to unpack a little bit there because I want to understand it better. I know that it is often said that Asia is really where all the growth is going to start to take place. To have growth in consumption, you must first have growth in investment. This stands to reason so that these innovations can get out there for people to then adopt. So it's great to see this curve of more investment coming from Asia. But, it, you know, the real growth is going to happen in Africa. That's where about 4 billion people, 3 to 4 billion people are going to um grow, if you will, in the next um, two and a half decades. And Asia, you're going to see about the growth of maybe 1 million people. So why do you say that, and I'm, I hear this all the time, that really is Asia the place for growth of alternative proteins? I, I think it's all, all the matter of timeline we are looking at, right? Like if we are looking at a really long timeline, definitely right, Africa will be the place, will be sort of the next, next wave at some point. But just sheer... Uh, the, the demographics and GDP numbers are are suggesting that in over the next decade or maybe 15 years, it still will be a decade of Asia, uh, even with this population trends. Um, uh, I think you now you have to link population with affluence, right? Just to right. see like what's the what's the purchase power, uh, what's the what sort of a overall affluence of consumers to even be remotely interested in those products. Uh, and, and I think Asia is definitely getting there. Some countries are already there and, and the rest of the countries are catching up. Uh, so, so that's, that's my take. Mm -hmm. Asia, a very big place, obviously. So let's break it down a little bit. I think we all think of Singapore as an innovation hub and dedicated mm -hmm. and, and also a, a, a city state that has food security issues. So dedicated to uh, finding stability and they have a program called 30 by 30. So they'd like to be responsible for 30% of their own food production by 2030. Right now they're only responsible for about 10% of their own food production. So that's a risky place to be. And if there's another pandemic and most epidemiologists say that we're on the cusp of another pandemic 
any minute now. So, um, you know, it's, it makes sense that they would focus on this. What about other, let's, let's not talk about China just yet. What, what are some other hot spots in Asia for alternative protein innovation and adoption? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and I think you, you rightly so started from Singapore. Singapore is probably the number one uh, hotspot at the moment. And also just, just a quick comment on that one. Um, I think what this policy, uh, 30 by 30 policy and the government support, what people may know already is that Singapore is the first country in the world to approve cultivated meat. At this point, they actually approved multiple products from the same company with multiple iterations of uh, uh, cultivated chicken. They also approved the first facility um, to, to manufacture uh, cultivated meat. What actually all this means is that a lot of companies, cultivated meat companies from around the world are now flocking to Singapore to start their product. There's no, no, sh no not less than five uh, international startups that announced that they want to launch their first products in Singapore. So that creates this very interesting hub for local innovation because there are a lot of uh, local startups as well. Uh, some of them uh, we supported. Um, and there are international startups who want to, uh, who want to uh, launch there. And, and one more reason, there's, it's not just government support, it's also very open-minded and sophisticated consumers, but, you know, and, and great dining scene. So like if you imagine cultivated meat company trying to find a perfect place to launch their first product, Singapore is great, right? Because they can pick from so many different restaurants, whether it's high-end or more mass market, and consumers are likely to be embracing it. And it was already proven by some of the launches before. Um, so that's, I think, the, the, the reason uh, that, that Singapore is so exciting. Um, now, other hubs of innovation, interesting things are happening in South Korea. Mm, so there are uh, at least 10, maybe more uh, cultivated meat companies in South Korea, quite a few plant-based as well. Uh, South Korea has the right talent, academic talent, the funding environment, and again, pretty affluent um, society to, to embrace uh, some of its early, early adopter products. Um, so, so we are watching, watching it carefully as well. Um, Southeast Asia, you know, it's emerging, some specific uh, cities and countries, uh, places like Jakarta in Indonesia or Manila in Philippines or Bangkok in Thailand. They're emerging as sort of next Asian metropolis uh, with, with more and more affluent consumers and consumers that are already starting to change their consumer consumption habits to, to some extent mirroring what we see in the West, reducing their meat consumption, looking for more environmentally friendly solutions, even, even starting to care about animal welfare. Um, so I think these are very interesting um, uh, next hubs. And the last place I want to mention is India. You know, we can talk about it separately because it's such a big and interesting market. Now, obviously, as of last few weeks, the, the, the biggest country in the world when it comes to population, um, officially. Um, and, you know, it's a it's an early market, definitely from a consumption perspective. It's a complicated market because it has 30% vegetarians, right? Like the biggest vegetarian market in the world, but not many people not everybody knows, but actually majority of Indians eat meat, just not a lot of it. Um, and then, but it's also a very interesting place from a scale-up perspective for some of these technologies, uh, because India was traditionally a scale-up place for many of the pharma products. And uh, our one of our thesis is that it might now become uh, a place to scale up uh, technologies like precision fermentation. Mm -hmm. So much to unpack there. And I do want to dive into it. But first, I want to say we're not talking about it today. But Israel in its own right, a hub and the Middle East having huge food insecurity issues, concerns, and therefore investing against it. So we will dive deep into the Middle East and um, probably Africa together in another show. And then I'll do a separate show just on Europe, because I think the news coming out of the US has sort of bullied, if you will, the other news of what's going on around the world. And in many ways, it's much more impactful because the lobbyists aren't there with alternative facts and just making up headlines as they go. So uh, consumers seem more ready to adopt. And there's lots of in, uh, investment and growth as we see. And then that's where the population is growing. Okay, so let's talk about India. And then from there, we will segue to China. Now, when I think of India, I think of 
the opposite of Singapore in that it has scale by the, by its its nature, its size, everything it does, it has to do at scale, obviously, given its size and how many people it has to feed. It has a history, as you say, of vegetarianism. And this is um, habitual, if you will. So they're used to it, but it also has cultural significance, I believe, if, if there's still religious ties, um, maybe that is no longer true. But historically, there was Jainism and a, a belief that... Uh, you didn't want to eat animals, so or shouldn't be eating animals. Maybe it's a moral feeling as much as um, a habitual practice. So there's all of this foundation to readily accept, and then there's this need to whatever you do, do it big. And I just wonder if um, the political environment you feel is stable enough to really let India be an innovation hotspot. I think India has been innovation hotspot in many other areas and, you know, like the, the, the tech companies, software tech companies, the, the scale and innovation is, is very impressive. And again, like coming back, to maybe unpacking a little bit what I said before about uh, pharma scale up. So about mm. depending on estimates, about 50 to 60 percent of world's vaccines are produced in India. It's it's a massive amount. Um, uh, and it is. Uh, it is. It is just uh, you know the, the hub. It's a, there's a great talent. There's access to great mm -hmm. talent. There's ta access to mm -hmm. facilities, um, and this industry has been built over the last few decades in, in terms of the uh, pharma and specifically vaccine production and other drugs production scale up. And mm -hmm. this is obviously done because it's far more affordable uh, out there. Um, so there's obviously direct connection between some of this production. Um, methods uh, in, in, in biopharma and in some of the technologies like precision fermentation and even down the line cultivated meat. Uh, so it's not yet happening, but there's interest, building interest, even among some of the scale-up facilities that are working with biopharma in putting food-grade facilities out there and building, you know, bioreactors and fermenters at scale to allow uh, some of this um, scale-up. One of the interesting cases is Perfect Day. The U.S. startup has actually purchased a manufacturing facility in India and subsequently even got approval for their uh, precision fermentation-derived dairy protein in India as the first company ever. Um, and, and, and they are starting to manufacture some of this. So they, they purchased the facility from pharma company, bankrupted pharma company in this case, and are kind of repurposing it to produce their precision fermentation dairy. Um, and it happens to be, by the way, the biggest dairy market in the world as well. Yeah. You know, the, the, know. the amount of milk produced and consumed in India is off the yeah. charts compared to any other um, any other country and region. Now, to your point, so I think innovation is 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 definitely fair. So I'm not concerned about that. It's just a very interesting consumer market. So the question for me is how much consumers will embrace it in the short term. Um, mm. And the reason is that. First of all, demographics and, and just um, uh, the, the, the affluence level. Uh, note that many people have disposable income to really pay premium for any of this product. So as long as we don't achieve price parity or price advantage, it might be a little tricky. Um, just a small part of the population uh, can mm -hmm. afford you know, a, a, any premium on the, on the basic products like, like food. Um, and the... Uh, second challenge is what we discussed about this vegetarian market. What I understand from when I'm talking to people that are much more familiar with the market than me, they tell me often vegetarians in India don't necessarily want to eat meat alternatives. They are you know, they usually grew up with you know they, they have as I'm sure you tried many of the amazing Indian dishes that are purely vegetarian by default, right? They don't need meat replacements in them. Uh, it's just it's just great as it on its own, and that's kind of the cuisine that vegetarian part of the population, which is about thirty percent, so hundreds of millions, are used to it. And they are, you know, in some cases, they are even um, disgusted by the by by the idea of eating something that is um, uh, meat like. So who so like these products are actually addressing, fortunately, majority of the population uh, that is eating meat. Um, However, you know, this population also has certain perceptions about vegetarian diet. So some of people who eat meat 
it used to be vegetarians. You know, there's a whole demographic shift and cultural mm -hmm. shift, I would say, uh, in India, where people grew up in vegetarian families and young people mm -hmm. now want to, as part of their rebellious you know, nature, they want to eat meat. Mm -hmm. um, well, they really look for meat replacements in this case. Now they want a real thing. Um, so that makes it a complicated market for this plant-based meat companies or meat alternatives companies to find, um, you know, find the right consumer and position the product well. I mean, luckily, it's an enormous market. I speak a lot on Wall Street with VegTech Invest. We're investing in the public markets in this space. And people always ask me, you know, who's really going to go for this product? The meat eater doesn't want it yet. And the vegans don't need it. They've been doing fine without it. And I always say, I'm not going for the entire market. That's $1.4 trillion. I'll take 10. I'll take 10% of that. That, that right. number, which is like $295 billion, looks really good to me. So I don't need the whole market. I just need uh, 8%. Uh, hey, I I'll take 6 I'll take 6%. You've negotiated well, no, me down. This, I'd be thrilled. This is, this is spot on. And this is, this is also true about most of Asia, actually. You have to find your consumer where it is today, and which usually means... You know, more affluent today, it's more affluent consumer, urban consumer in big metropolis. So in India, might be in Mumbai or Delhi. Uh, it's a small, small subset for now, but it's a good enough, as you say. Like just good the sheer enough. scale is 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 so huge that you know you can find already millions of consumers that are potentially interested in this, and that's why there's a whole wave of um, of alternative protein startups in India. I would argue that there's most most of the startups right now in the world in alternative protein are in India. They're usually small and just getting started. But but on a number basis, I'm sure that India is the, the largest. Um, you know, I, I have spoken with some of the great folks at the Plant Based Foods Association. And one of the things that I'd love for them to do or another organization would be to study the impact of good branding on consumer adoption, because I think we are at the maturity level, budgets aside, bad economies aside, we're at the maturity level of the market where it's time to really focus on the brand marketing. You know, is it plant-based for healthy kids? Is it plant-based for older people? Is it plant-based for the hip, cool environmentalists? Like, who are you going after? And really hone in on that marketing kind of riffing off of what David Young said, you have to outcool them. Because when you talk to me about oh, hey, there are people who grew up in vegetarian households in India and they say now it's cooler to eat meat and they've shifted away from what their parents did. My immediate combat to that is you should be marketing to that, not you in particular, but one sh would be marketing to that person. Mm. If you can't get them on food, then you get them on the environment and um, you know just how cool it is to be leading with carbon neutral food, net zero food, this kind of thing. We talk about it a lot in the public markets, having your portfolio be climate neutral, uh, net zero. Plant-based innovation does that. When you're not making the emissions, you don't need to buy carbon offsets because you're just avoiding the emissions altogether. I digress, but you know, the younger uh, consumer is so interested in the environment. So there's many ways to outcool them. It can be the innovation. It can be the tech. It can be the environment. These are things obviously you already know, but, um, and it can also be your health. I'm wondering when Asia is going to start to be bombarded with health messages, dairy is going to catch up to them in terms of bad health, rising healthcare costs, et cetera. Do you see that conversation happening at all? Um, it's it's complicated. That's the best way I can put it. It's uh, yeah, because actually dairy is positioned as a health food, right? Like very much so at this time, stage, and it's cons and this is the, the prevailing consumer perception across Asia. Uh, and I don't see this shifting last few years yet. So maybe maybe in this case, again, like either we find innovations that are just replacing the origin of dairy. Or it will just take a bit more time uh, for people to catch up to to sort of, you know, understand the pros and cons of this product. Mm. Well, uh, I'm saving the best for last because I really do want to dive into China and we will. But just a quick question before I ask you about China. Often, again, in um, Rethink X, they said, and I've heard meat industry 
executives say this to me in off the record interviews. Basically, I've interviewed everyone at some point or another. And I've had folks from Cargill say off the record, when it shifts, it's going to shift really quickly. And we want to be there because we're a protein company. We don't care what we sell you. You know, it doesn't have to be meat protein. I'm just here to sell you protein. So we want to be ready because when it shifts, it's going to go really quickly. Do you feel the same is going to happen in Asia? You're going to have this build up, and then the S curve is just going to take over. I think this is a fair. I think we'll, when we'll be talking about Asia, uh, China, this is this is uh, what I also believe may happen there. Well, hopefully, will happen there at some point. But it's true. It's true everywhere. I guess you know. At some mm-hmm. point, I think it's a smart thing for companies. Uh, in this industry, wider industry, to be ready because at some point things will accelerate. We have seen this with other technologies before, right? They were, mm-hmm. you know, slowly getting there for many years or decades in some cases and then dramatically accelerated. Mm-hmm. One of the things I talk about um, in my financial meetings is this is going to happen a lot faster than solar panels or electric vehicles because not everyone can say, I'm going to walk out today and buy a $60,000 electric vehicle or even trade in my current car and get 30,000 credit and I still have to spend 30,000 on a new vehicle, what have you. Or, you know, most people don't want to rip off their roof. It's too inconvenient and put on solar panels. It's expensive, takes time. You have to live through construction. Just not that hard to say, I'm going to let my fingers shift over in the grocery store about three inches and I'm going to grab the plant-based thing and pay a dollar more. Just not that hard in comparison to making that kind of shift once or twice a week. As you and I agreed, we are going for 10% of the market. If you have 21 right. meals a week, three meals a day, seven days a week, you have 21 meals, you're talking about two meals a week. One's out at a restaurant and you just you know, got out of a doctor's appointment that says he eat less red meat and you're like, fine, I'll do it. And then, you know, somebody else cooks you something or whatever you, you know, two meals out of 21, just not a big deal. So, um, you know, when, once that starts to shift the dominoes fall, I mean, one can only hope. So let's talk about China. Let's get into it. When we talk about China, obviously we're talking about the scale And when you talk about that kind of scale, it comes with so much. So it comes with the ability to make people's lives exponentially better, either with plant-based or just with food in general. Let's not even talk about our sector yet. Just the fact of China becoming wealthier and therefore having more access to food shifts how many people are nourished and then maybe get education and then maybe, I mean, just the, the the brain potential. I don't want to be too esoteric here, but um, China becoming wealthier and having more access to food, I think is going to change innovation, period. I guess that's a bit of a leap. But um, now China being food insecure, if I'm not mistaken, only 7% of China's land is uh, available to grow food. So they are deeply food insecure, and they get a lot of their food from us. Now, very hard to see us as a trading um, adversary if we control their food. So pigs and soy, these things go from us to China. Uh, So I would think from a political standpoint, in addition to feeding one's own people, you'd want to shore up food security or you can't really have political power. I'm taking this conversation in lots of different directions. And then there's this fear about China coming from the United States, what China means and represents. And I think maybe there's fear in Asia as well. So let's unpack that one by one. Um, What kind of wealth growth are we seeing in China? And if you don't know the answer to this, it's okay, because I didn't prep you on this. (laughs) I mean, yeah, it's obviously, I don't have a numbers top of my head, but, you know, I think we have seen this last few decades, but it's just... uh, the enormous, enormous growth in wealth yeah. you know, from from the country that, on average, uh, had had people that you would have to call poor. Now, most most people are anywhere between fairly okay to like very affluent, right? Like it's and and you can see it. I, I just traveled to China last month, and you can really see first time mm-hmm. since pandemic, and she said since first time since many years, and the the difference is just enormous. It's it's the growth is is shocking. In, in many ways, and uh, uh, it's it's by far the fastest growing um, economy and society in the last few decades, obviously, and it's visible. Um, I think so, you know, and I, I think you're right. Like, we, we, there is a connection to food and nutrition, and and 
over the last few decades, I think this is also very visible. So now I think China consumes twice as much meat as US. Yes. Um, and but per capita, it's still about half of uh, of US. Um, so that's 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 where things are. Um, and I think it will, you know, with, with the current trend, it will continue. So we talked about 40% of meat, right, being produced in Asia, over 40%, over 70% of seafood. If you break it down farther, majority of this 40% China. is in China. Majority yeah. of this 70% is in, in China. And seafood. Uh, yeah, seafood in China. Okay, so... What they're doing with their wealth is they're not going for plant-based alternatives or alternative proteins, or are they? What's what's their, you had said there's a distrust or maybe we'll unpack that for right. us. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Very interesting one. So um, yeah, definitely there's this wealth and meat connection, right? So by no, by it's more so than in China than anywhere else, I would say that uh, that meat is considered uh, a, a symbol of affluence, seafood to some extent as well. Um, and and people want to eat it and they eat it now when they couldn't really you know, afford it uh, before. And no surprise, you know, this is exactly how one would probably predict this will, this will happen. Um, and then where does it leave meat alternatives? Um, it's tricky because, you know, meat alternatives and not just tofu, uh, but specifically plant-based meat replacements were around for many decades or maybe even centuries. So like actual meat alternatives were invented in China. And I'm not just talking about tofu, but, you know, seitan and soy-based meat replacements. Not TVP as kind of thing. TVP, exactly, exactly. Like that's, that's, that's what consumers have seen around for many, many decades. Now, it was considered two things and still is. One is cheap source of protein, like a cheap version of meat. And maybe more so even, the very it was specifically targeted to religious or Buddhist vegetarians. So it has this perception that this is not for everyone. Uh, this is not definitely not considered a symbol of affluence. It is something for a very specific group of people. Um, so mass market consumer doesn't necessarily want to eat this kind of products. They occasionally do in different contexts. Uh, so for example, there are quite, um, quite, quite commonly you can find like a soy based meat like snacks, the cheap snacks in convenience stores is like jerky, I guess, with flavored jerky. Um, but again, this is considered like the ch it's the cheapest option in convenience store, right? You can still get a meat snack, uh, but it's a bit more expensive. So if you can afford it, uh, one probably would, would buy that. Uh, so there's this perception of this being cheap and specifically for religious people. And that doesn't help this new generation of alternative mm -hmm. protein, right? To build their positioning in the market. Because how do they differentiate? Uh, many of these products are still based on the same ingredient on soy. They're not so fundamentally different to convince consumers they are offering something new, at mm -hmm. least so far. Uh, so that's that's the situation. Okay, but and I like the consumer; they're important. I would never say that they're not. But if it were just about the consumer, the meat lobby would squash them, and this whole thing would be over. So I see three main stakeholders: the consumer, governments that are focused on national security and food security. You're not staying in office if you can't feed people. It's food and water. For, forget other, forget the race to space. We're in a race for food and water. And then industry. Now, maybe not so much in China, but in the U.S., bad actors in the marketplace are under scrutiny for their methane emissions. But also of late, you've seen an enormous amount of reporting on the dumping and workers' conditions in the United States Companies like Tyson that have decades of ammonia-related burns, they haven't cleaned up their act in 10 years. CNN just did a really in-depth report on that. You're seeing um, JBS dumping into the Illinois River and going through a series of lawsuits. You see workers um, in meat processing plants hiring teenagers, kids as young as 13, cutting themselves and injuring themselves and working at night, let alone underage working. 
And I could go on. We all saw the images during COVID of who was meant to work and how they were meant to work in diapers, et cetera. I mean, so at least in the United States, perhaps again, less so in China, you have this scrutiny about how companies comport themselves and what they are responsible for in the market. So it's one thing to say like, hey, I got cheap meat for you. Oh, but then I'm going to dump all this really expensive uh, cost structure on you to reduce emissions and to clean up the river I just polluted and uh, increased healthcare costs that I'm contributing to. I could go on. So um, I think when you put those three things together, at least for the U.S., industry is going to have to change. And they're not so opposed to it, as you heard Cargill say, we just want to be there with protein. And the reason is animals are extremely inefficient. They're awful business equations. And it takes 25 to 35 calories of feed to get one calorie of cow, 15 to 16 for one calorie of pig, nine for one calorie of chicken. What investor says, hey, let me give you 35 cents. No, I just want a penny back. It's okay. It's all I want. I mean, it's awful. It's, uh, the waste is just, um, no one would voluntarily do that kind of business equation today. So industry is willing to change. Governments have to change. And the consumer wants something else. Now you put these three together they all want change at the same time for different reasons, but at the same time. So I see that the consumer is one of three main components. What do you think? Oh, no, for, for sure. Uh, so I think where I see opportunity in China uh, for change is really coming from government, right? So government has obviously a huge impact um, and they already in other industries, they have shown, you know, the way to to build industries and, and manage these transitions. And the best example is uh, and, you know, electric vehicles uh, or what they call in uh, China, new energy vehicles, that's how it's called. Um, so right now, I think one in every four cars sold in China is electric. Uh, and this happened literally over the last few years or maybe a decade, a little over a decade. It, it's, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, when I was in, in China, what's, what was most surprising for me is that most of the taxis are electric, and this is totally government driven, which is required right now for mm -hmm. local governments or local government and, and national government requires for um, sort of more of a public services, um, you know, and also come, it also is buses and taxis to become electrified. Um, and there are specific policies around encouraging EVs and discouraging uh, the petrol cars. In, in, in different cities and so on. So this is really driven. And there are two things here. One is this obviously helps with the environment. So one driver is environmental pollution, but also builds a, a industry. China is the biggest EV market in the world and biggest manufacturer of EVs and soon to be or already the biggest battery manufacturer. So they want to be a leader in this space. So I think this is the, the hope for, for China and for Asia and for the world in this in alternative protein is that something like this ha will happen um, in alternative protein in China. So the government at some point may decide we want to put this on a top agenda. We believe in this. We want to build industry out of this. We see benefits um, and, 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 and build it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, and then consumers will come along. You know, like I, I think that's, that's how, that's the best way to think about it. I can see why the government would want to do that for political security. Whoever owns the IP on food is going to be very secure. So I can see just like they did with electric vehicle batteries, they pretty much, they being China, pretty much owns that market as I understand it. And the rest of the world is converging to electric vehicles and now they have to get all of their batteries from China. So you, <coughs> excuse me, it's like owning semiconductors, the chips that go in computers. Right. If you own the batteries for electrical vehicles, you own that market. So if you own the IP, and I don't know if this will ever be the case, that one country might own the IP. But if you, you know, um, have cracked the code for, let's say, cultivated meat, then you've got a lot of power. Well, let me um, ask. It's just, just, sorry to interrupt you, but like no, it's not just don't. IP, right? It's also the, the, the possibility to manufacture it at scale. You know, I think China is not the only country that is owning IP for batteries, but they just built all these massive facilities and they have a cost advantage and it's just the most affordable place to, uh, and most reliable, I guess, to source these batteries from. So you can imagine something similar for at least some of these technologies in alternative protein. 
So my question to you is twofold. Does China, which is trying to move towards an open economy, but but not an open political system, a gross overstatement, and I don't live there, so please you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but generally more markets, um, economy, and still a tight hold on society. Does the government have the kind of power where they can say, from now on, 50% of all your meals are plant-based meat? Could they do that? Probably not. I, I don't think they would do that, uh, even if they could, uh, because obviously it's a sensitive topic. Food is a sensitive topic. As we discussed, people consider meat uh, the, the, the symbol of affluence. They have certain perceptions about plant-based. Uh, so I think this wouldn't be a smart move uh, from any government to, to force it that way. Um, and they have to sort of take into consideration uh, consumer perception. So I think this will happen... If it's, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen more gradually, first of all. And yeah, there will be probably some policies, but there will be also just building a business and building the industry and innovation, right? Like making sure that there actually are products that are uh, that consumers crave, that consumers want, that consumers consider nutritious and cool, as we discussed. Uh, and, and this will not happen overnight, but I think uh, by sort of different policies and funding to support the government and support the local e ecosystem, uh, this may happen over time. You see the benefit of cultivated meat. It's just the win, like in the Venn diagram of life, it's like the win, win, win. The You get the cool factor, you get the um, tech IP, you get the environmental benefit, and you get the status of I'm eating my meat, my rare filet mignon, or, you know, for now we're looking at like cows, but what if you could really show your status chops by saying, oh, I I ordered leopard. Like I, I clearly would never do this, but you know, I ordered leopard or I threw a dinner party of um dinosaur or what have I'm right. The the um possibilities are oh, endless. My man, yes, right. Yeah, mammoth possibilities. Um, what about so in the US? I just got back from the Milk and Global in, in, Milk and Institute Global Conference. China was a big topic. China, political insecurity, uh, an unstable political situation globally. So I know, and I think my listeners know, the trepidation about about China, although they can't quite put their finger on why. And I'm not saying I necessarily share it. I'm just saying the pulse that I see in the, the United States is China's gaining more power. We're kind of struggling. And what does that power struggle look like? And how do we come out of that equation? It seems to be on at least investors' minds. I'm wondering, my impression when I travel through Asia, and I've been all throughout Southeast, all throughout Asia, is they also have, I'll say, a healthy amount of fear towards China. And I'd like to better understand that. I think it's because of China's size and China's willingness to go into other countries and kind of buy up that which is vital. Electrical facilities, dams, infrastructure that makes people feel beholden to China or potentially under their control. But I'd like to understand how Asia views China. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated relationship, as you can imagine. It's, uh, um, it is obviously, yeah, like, like even more so visible uh, superpower in, in Asia, right? Like it's, it's as much as, I guess, you can sort of try to forget and ignore it uh, just for geographical reasons when you're in the, in the West. You know, it's, it's unavoidable uh, because of its outsized impact in, in most of Asia. But in the same time, I think, you know, there are, most of the Asian countries currently have very good uh, trade relationships with China. It's probably the major, um, major, major trade partner for most of the countries uh, there. It is investing um, often in, you know, in emerging markets in Asia and Southeast Asia. It's 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 running different projects, um, and and some of them are like crucial infrastructure projects, uh, and some of them are really transforming these local economies. Um, so it's it's really a, a, a complex relationship, um, and on the other hand, I think there's like also cultural connection. You know, like chi China, um, Chinese consumers. Like when now when the borders opened up, the first place that everybody wants to go is Thailand, 
um, yeah. you know, and, 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 and Thailand is embracing Chinese tourists. So it's, mm. it's, it's a complex relationship, I would say. When I was in Laos, I was struck by how much the Chinese had taken over agricultural land. Obviously, as we discussed before, they don't have food security and they have to import food. And I've heard that they're doing the same um, in large quantities in Africa. They had taken over indigenous land and they had mowed it down and they were growing banana trees so that they could export the bananas back to China. So it is a difficult relationship indeed. And it, it brings us back to that which unites all of us be one in Asia or the US, there's only so much land and so much water. So as we grow the population from 8 billion people to 10 billion people, you're just not getting more room. And so as the Chinese population grows, and I don't fault them for this, as you said early on, like, why should we deprive people of the food we've been eating like, like gluttons for decades? So it's their turn, so to speak. That's not really the right expression. But, you know, the, the problem isn't that there are people on the planet that want to consume food and delicacies. The problem is that the planet isn't growing and we are. So we're going to have to be more efficient about how we produce those delicacies. That's it. It's business, folks. It's business. As always, business saves the world. It is business indeed that takes a problem and solves it at scale. That's where you get value. That's where you create wealth. And by the way, that's where you create jobs. So you and I are in the right business, Mikhail. Um, from different standpoints, I'm investing in the public markets and uh, hopefully you all are joining me in that. And uh, Mikhail, you're in venture, which is so fun with Better Bite Ventures. Everybody, you can see the uh, website on your screen, betterbite.vc. And I'm sure you can sign up for the newsletter there, right? Future Food Now newsletter, you can sign up there and do it, everybody. Better Bite. You can sign it on uh, uh, futurefoodnow.info would be the best place to go for the newsletter. Yeah. Okay. Futurefoodnow.info. Okay. As we wrap up here, a couple quick exit questions. Thank you for your time today. We've gone over and I just, I know I could talk to you for hours. So really I do appreciate that. What are your predictions for Asia for the next three years? I'll say for alternative proteins. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, for next three years, I think, I think we'll see continue uh, growth and in investment. So that's the, most important thing. So, you know, we are at 19% of global investments coming to Asia right now, but you can see still this gap right between 19% of investments and 40% of meat consumption, 70% of seafood consumption. So I hope that investments will continue uh, and this will help to build the ecosystem. And then governments, uh, as we discussed extensively, will actually see uh, the need, more and more need uh, to ensure this food security and will drive, you know, policies, approvals of this uh, different uh, products. I think we'll see more approvals in Singapore. We'll see more approvals in other countries over the next few years for cultivated meat and precision fermentation products. So, you know, the ecosystem in three years will be much more robust with much more money flowing in and consumers more on board. Mm -hmm. I see the same. I see more um, investment coming through. I see more governments investing heavily. And I'm looking for that really groundbreaking innovation. So far, it's pretty much been the US kind of leading on the innovation scale. And I don't see that happening. As the investments come from other countries, I see that other countries are going to be leading the way in investing, uh, sorry, in innovation. And I just can't wait for that to happen and see what comes out of that. Okay, a personal question for you, a couple of personal questions before we let you go. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Oh, um, <laughs> you know, 10 years ago, I guess I guess I wished, uh, 10 years ago, it was still very under the radar, this whole industry for me. And obviously it was under the radar because, you know, no, no, no major, like beyond and impossible were still... Um, uh, still in stealth mostly, I believe. So I, f I think I, would, I wish I had some sort of insights. I just turned vegan around that time. Um, I wish I, have, I could see you know, how much this industry will grow and get involved even earlier. That would be, that would be great. Mm, it's wonderful. I always say that I wish I had used my voice earlier. I wish I realized the power of my own voice earlier. Uh, all right. So you're running around. You're super busy. You're maybe traveling all throughout Asia. You miss your flight. Things aren't going your way. What's a phrase you tell yourself to get yourself back in the groove? Right, right. I'm more of a 
uh, doer than than talker, I guess in this case. So I, I I have this I have this thing that that mood follows action. So I try to do something physical mm -hmm. rather than talk myself into something. So if if I have if I can, I just go for a walk or run. Um, that's that's my favorite way to sort of change the mood and change the outlook. It's like architecture, form follows function, but here you're saying mood follows action. I like it and I shall try to live by it myself. Always benefit from a run. Okay, my very last question for you, same day, you're still running around like crazy, but this time, not only did you miss that flight and you're having to like take a walk around the airport because you're all frustrated, but you haven't had time for lunch. What is your go-to snack? Right, if it's if it's airport in Asia or any place Just in Asia, whatever. it's probably- you're, you're busy, no, it's, eat, okay. Right, it's probably you know this Japanese snack onigiri, the rice rice bowl. Uh, it's usually a rice yeah. triangle stuffed with with different stuff. Oh yeah, uh, it's everywhere in Asia and all convenience stores. That's my go-to, like wrapped in nori. Um, that's my go-to, and usually easy to find vegan version. Uh, when I'm in the U.S., I usually stock up on mushroom jerky. I actually have one with myself even from last trip. Uh, the pans mushroom jerky. Oh, yeah. That's that's my favorite. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm a huge fan of all y'all's jerky out of Texas, taking on the beef beef industry in Texas, all y'all's jerky. But yeah, I can't go wrong with some plant-based jerky. I feel you there. Michael, Mikhail, Klar, I am so happy to have you on the Plant-Based Business Hour way too long. I've been doing this since 2018. I can't believe we had to wait till 2023 to have you on, the expert that you are. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for Better Bite Ventures, Future Food Now newsletter. You want to go to futurefoodnow.info to get that new newsletter folks. And of course, you can always find um, Mikael on LinkedIn, just like you can find me on LinkedIn. Thank you for being with me today and all you do. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. And thanks for all you do. Uh, so kind of you. Okay, you don't go away, Mikael, but everybody else on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and who am I forgetting? Uh, Facebook. I will see you all next week. Thanks for sticking with me on my crazy schedule as I travel the world. I'll probably come to you again next week, not Tuesday, but Monday. Anyways, I will see you all live, everybody. Thanks for all you do. Bye, folks.